I'm incredibly excited to be here today with you, Jerry. Thank you. And um, I, I would love everybody to start. Um, if you know any of Jerry's books, I mean, how many of you have ever seen any of Jerry Pinckney's books? Raise your hand. And how about, <laughs> how about a big round of applause to express how much you, you admire Jerry's books? Thank you. So I'm going to start with a question that, you know, we're, we're going to talk today about this book, which is called A Place to Land. And we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, where the idea for that title came and what it means. But, but I kind of think that first, Jerry, and, um, you know, this isn't really specific to this book, mm -hmm. but how did you know, at what time in your life did you know that your calling, that your mission in life was to be an artist who makes books? Well, I mean, I started pretty much like I think all of you guys that are sitting down at, uh, on the front on the rug here. Um, I started drawing as soon as mom or dad or someone adult gave me something to mark with and something to mark on. And uh, I, so I started drawing, and, um, and as most kids do, they draw. You draw to sort of uh, fill space or time. For me, though, it was something else. It was a little bit of a safety net for me as well, because I'm dyslexic, so I had trouble reading. But there was one thing that I could do very well that some of the other students could. I could draw. But I wasn't, Bill, thinking about becoming an artist. Huh. It was a matter, because there were no artists in my neighborhood or my family. So it was a matter of something that I loved doing, and eventually I was encouraged to do. And it wasn't until 12 or 13 when I met my first professional artist here in Germantown that I began hmm. to think about the possibility that maybe if I studied hard and I worked hard, maybe, just maybe, I could become an artist. But something else that really feeds right into this book, and it's very important, even though I showed talent, I loved drawing at that time. People of color were told there was no space for me to draw. So there was on one hand, encouragement on the other really um, in a sense of, of blockades or a wall that was put up in front of me. The beauty of it for me is that not knowing that I wanted to become an artist, but drawing gave me a safe place to go. It was a safe space. So if people told me I couldn't draw, then I would return to draw because that was, that made me me. That completed me, it made me feel good. Uh, and so it was later, much, much later than I decided that no matter what people said, I was gonna to continue to draw because there was always possibility. Wow. So I'm gonna ask you one other lead-in question. Sure. And, it, and this one I think now does get us into this beautiful book. Um, Jerry, you were talking about that it started with drawing. Um, and yet, most of the work that you do is a medium called watercolor. Yes. And I'm guessing that some people in the room know what watercolor is. But I wonder, Jerry, if you would just, and I'm going to hold up some images um, so you see here the face of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And this is made by Jerry with a kind of paint that is called watercolor. And I wonder if you'll explain what watercolor is and why it's something that is so important to you or that you arrived at at the medium that is, that is right for you and for you to express your, yourself. Well, first of all, I think most of you guys have known about watercolor because it's usually the first medium that you're, you're, you're offered up in school or maybe at home. It's a transparent medium 
And the transparency comes from the, the actually color itself, but then adding water. It's the pigment or the color. And then you add water to it, and it thins out that, that color. Uh, for me, it's important because in, in, at heart, um, I'm a drawer. I've, I mean, I started out drawing. Now, here's something really kind of cool, right? Um, I started out, and my favorite tool has always been the pencil. My grandfather worked in a pencil factory at the end of the block where I lived on Earlham Street. So I had plenty of pencils. <laughs> so that's me. But, but in terms of watercolor and pencil, which is most of my work, um, with watercolor, you, you'll notice if you go to the library, there will be more books on how to do watercolors than any, any other medium. And that is because people have expectations. Watercolor, well, the beauty of watercolor is you have to be present at the time. Um, and my mind works in such a way, it kind of wanders at times. And I try to bring it back and it wanders again. Watercolor, because it's so immediate, it demands my attention. Um, so it's a, it's a medium that fits my personality. Most artists, will gravitate toward the medium for some reason or another, it just feels right for them, feels right for what they want to say. Watercolor is right for what I want to say. So, um, Jerry, you talked a little bit about pencils. Yes. And I'm gonna let you in on a secret. I've already heard a version of that story and I knew that Jerry's family worked in a pencil factory. Um, Jerry's grandfather Father, worked yes. in, a, in a pencil factory. The first thing I noticed when I opened the first page of this book is that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the first image you see is a man holding, what, can somebody tell me what is he holding? What's that? A pencil. Yes. Was that on purpose? Well, he actually, <laughs> his, his, it's amazing his, how things sort of come around full circle. He, his rough drafts were on pencil, with pencil on, on yellow legal pads. Now, I'm gonna, I want to tell you something which is very interesting. Before I knew yeah. that, I have always done most of my thumbnail sketches on yellow legal pads. Huh. So, um, it, but that's, that's the beauty of, I think, opening yourself up. You, all these things that seem to uh, fall into place. So, Jerry, one of the things that I know about you is that you do a lot of historical research yes. before you start any project. And by historical research, what I mean is going to libraries, mm -hmm. going to museums, going to places where historical things are preserved, and looking at them, sometimes even touching them, to understand what they're about. Did you see any of the actual notes that that I did. Dr. Martin Luther King made? I did, made? actually. One wow. of the, yeah, one of the things that's so beautiful about uh, Googling is that you can Google any, almost anything. And at one point, I wanted to kind of connect to his own handwriting. At one point, I thought I kind huh. of uh, sort of imitated at times. Uh, and then I backed away from that. But yes, there was a lot of, a lot of research uh, not only in the, you mentioned a library, which is a source of mine, but also I have a very, I collect books, and especially on black history and black culture. So the first library I went to was my own. And then I expanded on that. And then there was a certain point uh, when trying to capture Dr. Dr. King, I thought about film, which we all had access to as well. So I watched a lot of films. As a matter of fact, some of the portraits really were from when he was caught in a, in a, in a phrase or a word. And I would do a film shot, you know, huh. shot. And, and because I wanted this book to be immediate uh, and I didn't want it to actually, com not necessarily compete, but parallel the fact that that was one of the, at that time, the most documented um, events um, with photography. Wow. Yeah. I, I think it's something that I admire 
a great deal in a lot of the artists whose work I really love. Um, I admire artists who are curious about things and who approach their projects with that sense of curiosity. And Jerry, I think that it's a great lesson that you give to all of us here in this room that when you're starting a project and you know, want to make your own statement about something, that, that understanding the truth of it yeah. is, is, is a foundation. Like, what is the thing that really happened? And how do we know? And what are the details about that that uh, make it come to life? Such as the idea, and I didn't know this, mm -hmm. that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. liked to work on a certain kind of paper, and that he liked to use a pencil, and that he would make drafts written out of what he was preparing to say. So I didn't know anything about yeah. that, but I've learned that from you now. And I think it's something that you know, makes the beautiful art married to the beautiful words in this book, something special. Um, you know, there is thoughtful research that goes into understanding a historical truth. And that's in part of what the art is expressing. And I love artists that try to approach that. And Jerry, I would say you're not the only artist who is doing that kind of research before they get into a project. The artist Edith Neff, whose paintings are on the wall around us, you can probably see that she also worked from photographs of real places. And so, you know, there's a painting of, a, of an ornate, you know, sort of old-fashioned looking hotel against the beach of Atlantic City. And you can see on the label next to it that she took photographs of the actual building so that her painting could express something of the truth of that place, of Atlantic City, which is a beach nearby, um, to Philadelphia, where a lot of Philadelphia people go to the beach. Yeah, I have a question. So why don't you come up here and you can ask your question into the microphone or if you say it louder, I'll repeat your question, whatever you would like. Oh. So, so the question or the statement was that you know, Atlantic City is a real place to you because you've, you've been there. And I think that one of the nice things about this museum, because we're a museum of Philadelphia's artists, a lot of the artists in this museum have the same experience that you've had of going to that same beach. And it's kind of one of the nice things about the art that you can see here. You know, maybe you've been to that very same beach or maybe you've seen the Mummers Parade on New Year's Day, for example. And so, I like art that I can relate to, and I bet you do too. That's yeah. very cool. That, so, Bill, that yeah. kind of leads right into yeah. the reason for the collage. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we, we look at a place of land, and it sort of feeds into what uh, Bill and this young lady was, was saying, is that um, there's a use of collage. Um, and the collage are made up of, of the places where the event the, um, took place, the March on Washington. Uh, it was the Willard Hotel, uh, the National Mall, uh, the um, uh, Oval Office in the White House. And the reason for collage, and that's new for me, was the fact that these were real places. And I wanted the reader and the viewer to connect um, to those places. So I thought, what better way to do it is to actually take photographs of those spaces um, and actually incorporate them uh, with my drawing and my, my watercolor. Now, you'll see that there is um, a way that I approached it, and that is that I, at times I wanted the um, collage or photographs that I use to stand on their own like the stained glass windows where we see uh, that represents uh, Dr. King and his ministry. 
But there are other times in the beginning where it's the Willard Hotel. I wanted you to also, I wanted to pose a question. Is this a drawing or is it a photograph? So they somewhat blend in. So I used both of those as a, and as an artist, you want a certain sense of tension in your work. So um, I used collage to set up that tension between art and photography or illustration and photography. Um, and then I also used it for the sense of place. And the idea, the idea was that if you were visiting Washington, either at the mall or you were walking past the Willard Hotel, one might stop, pause, remember a place to land and think, this took place here. Now, I have a photograph and a presentation that I do where I was actually in the lobby of the Willard Hotel where the first meeting was, had taken place. Now, the beauty of all this is that it's a new Willard Hotel. It's, you know, it's been uh, redone over and over again. However, the service desk, the same service desk where Dr. King checked in, I stood. Wow. And that's the hope, and that was the reason for the um, collage, is maybe, maybe you like that beach scene and, and the connection between Atlantic City that in Washington you would think about, wow, 250,000 people gathered at this spot, this same spot I'm standing on, and heard Dr. King speak. So, Jerry, that is a beautiful description that you just gave, and I thought I would open the book to the yes. page where you have um, the image of, of the hotel itself. And, and I encourage, if anybody wants to come up closer, because um, here is Jerry's watercolor. Mm -hmm. And in this lower part of the building, this is what Jerry means by collage, right? So collage means what? That you would take images it's, it's torn from, from another right. or taken out of another... Yeah, context, uh, just, yeah, right, just, place. Well, they, in this case, oftentimes what I would do, in this case, it really what I did, because this is important, I wanted to show something that dealt with the interior of the Willard Hotel. But it had to be the Willard Hotel in the 1960s. It couldn't be the Willard Hotel of today. So I then Googled Willard Hotel, 1950s, and I came up with one shot, one photograph that I used. Yes. Wow, and so here's the watercolor, and here's a portion of that image right. that you found online of the actual hotel at the yeah. time. Yeah. And so by, by incorporating, and you know, this is, this is what creativity is about, right? Jerry, you figured out a way to make these images meaningful, yeah. to make them real. So you made your watercolor, which comes from your hand. Right. But in order for all of us to see this image and understand, oh, this is what it really looks like, or maybe it's not what it looks like today, but this is what it looked like in the late 1960s when the events in this book take place. You provide this um, photograph of, of the hotel. Now I have another question for you. A lot of the images in your collages are blurry. Why is that? Because I see here's a clear image of the hotel and here's a blurry image of the hotel. Why? Well, it's interesting because it, 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 sometimes I even carried it further. Not only is the image just blurred because uh, the process of, of, of copying the image over and over and over again. Um, now, why did I do that? Well, I wanted, there's a clarity and a crispness to a photograph. And I didn't want my art to compete in some level. I wanted them to knit together, to mesh together. There are times when I actually, when the photograph became very too strong, I would use sandpaper or still wool to tone it down and to bring it into the same sort of focus or same value level as my art. So there are some things now, why did I, 
Mr. Pinkney, why did you do that? I don't always know. It's the magical, <laughs> it's, the, it's the beauty of when and you're doing creative work. And you know, I can ask any of you young people, what happens when you're doing something and you're not quite sure how it's gonna turn out? And it surprises you. And when I work, I look to surprise myself. Now, sometimes it doesn't always go that way. <laughs> uh, sometimes it, it's, uh, it surprises me, but not in a way I had hoped for. Uh, and, but at the same time, so you redo it. But, so why that now? And here's another question I'm gonna pose, and I wanna talk about it because it, it sort of parallels your question about the blurriness of the photographs. I've done collage not a lot, uh, but I have used it in my work. Sometimes I cut out through the images. I cut out, use, I use scissors or an X-Acto knife. In this case, all of the elements that I added are torn. I would take a photograph or something and I would actually tear it. And if you ask me why not use scissors, I wouldn't know the answer. I do know that there was a part of how I wanted to tell this particular story that maybe, hey, you know what? It, why blurry? Mm -hmm. Why torn? Softer. And I tore the images to give them a softer edge because then that's the same why, reason why some of the photographs are blurred. It also, incorporated something where I controlled something that already existed. And so it allowed me to take something, uh, to appropriate something, to borrow and make it my own. Yes. Yeah. Well, that, that's so, it's, it's, it's amazing to hear about this process because, you know, I think one of the great things about art is that you know, different people see different things in it. And, um, you know, when I'm hearing you describe your process, I'm thinking about, you know, what I see in the image. Yeah. And I'm looking at an image of a hotel that's, you know, about 50 years old. This, mm -hmm. the, you're yes. depicting something and you're depicting events that happened, you know, more than 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I saw that blurry image, I thought, oh, so when we think about the past, you know, we're thinking across time, and sometimes, you know, memories are blurry, and you have to piece things together from little fragments, and that's what you give us. And then you build the watercolor of the whole hotel out of the fragments of the past that you were able mm -hmm. to find. And I find that very moving. And I also like art, where artists are honest mm -hmm. about their process. And I feel that everything that you just said, Jerry, that you can actually see the illustrations in the book and feel how you did that. I want to add something to yeah. that, and, and, yeah. and, and this is very interesting. My wife, Gloria Jean, is over here, and she's seen the artwork and, and many, many times in, in all kinds of form. And she, was, she said to me this morning, do you know there's, um, there's a little bit of a collage you guys can't see, but let me describe it, uh, where I added uh, a piece of the sky and the flag. I wanted the flag to be a real flag. And so I tore, I found a flag over on a, in a calendar or something, and I tore it out and I added it. And then Gloria said to me, you know that there's a, there's, you know, behind the, be, the, behind the flag, there's a, it's, the sky is dark. So, and she said, did you do that on purpose? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? She says, well, you know, like where we are today and there's a darkness, and did you do that on purpose? And I said, no, but the beauty is, in my work, I want you to take ownership. I want you to find things and find meaning. Hopefully I, I invite that through the art itself, um, that you invest, you find answers in the art. So not only am I in just interpreting a text, but I'm also leading you into that space. 
and making you think about that time period. So um, again, it's, it's, and I don't know, by the way, if it's working or not. I never know whether my art really works until you give me feedback, until you believe in what I've invested in. Now, there's some other thing, I, and, I, and I, all of us here, and you young people, have seen images of Dr. King in front of a podium or a lectern, and he's speaking in the most elegant way, um, the most inspiring way. Bill, you talked about truth and being an artist. I also, in this particular project, and Barry Wittenstein, the writer who I collaborated with, did provide me the springboard. But what was most important to me was that I told the story about Dr. King in the most fullest, the deepest way possible. And so I did a lot of research, as Bill said. And one of the things that struck me was his, not only the power uh, and control he had when he was in front of a, and he was talking to an audience, but the weight of what this man must have been carrying. Now, I don't know, and we don't know how he carried the weight, but we can all perhaps think about how much weight and how, how we could carry that. And so I wanted to speak to that sort of truth. I wanted to show him certainly in his, all of his iconic, elegant humbleness. But I always so wanted to talk about his vulnerabilities. And in that process of research, there were a number of images that sort of just stuck with me. I, I couldn't shake those images. One of the images was Dr. King in front of, um, uh, with marchers. And we probably have all seen this photograph. He had just been shot before. And, and, and um, so he had threats on his life. So he's in front of this group of marchers and a car backfires and he winces. You see him duck. Now, that is not in Barry Wittenstein's text, but that's the fullness. I wanted to talk about this man who was as human, who had this weight. And actually, when I first started working in the middle of this project, I too became somewhat dismayed and down by the reasons why he was watching, the reason for his speeches and uh, his sermons. And then I thought about his vulnerability. And interesting enough, his vulnerability made him larger to me. Hmm. He was a bigger person uh, when he winced because I could connect in some way to what he was feeling. So there's this one illustration which I never knew whether it worked or not. Let's see, it's, it's always tricky, right? It has to be the next one. This is a portrait of Dr. King that most of us have not seen before. And it was important to me to include, he's worried. He's worried the weight is getting to him. And I knew that this was an important illustration. And I knew at the time I had to take all of my artistic practice, my sense of making a good picture, a, a picture that invited you in. So great color, great line, great drawing. And I pushed it aside because it was, it was more important, the content, that we all connect to what he was carrying. And, and I wasn't, and, and even though it wasn't, it wasn't the illustration that grabbed me in terms of an artist looking at art, what did grab me though was when I shared it to other people and they would stop 
at this particular illustration mm -hmm. because then it wasn't about the art, it was about the man and it was about the time. Wow, and, and it's, it's a particularly beautiful set of pages, I think. Um, and I guess, you know, I'd love to ask you, Jerry, if we can describe what's going on. I mean, you usually think of your books in terms of two pages at a time. Right. Like, what's going to be next yeah, I, there's to a, an image? Uh, there's, a, in a sense, a juxtaposition there. I wanted to see, show that where he's in his hotel room, he's alone, and he's pondering and he's thinking about this message. And he's trying to balance, by not only that, I mean, trying to balance the sense of history, what has happened, but he's also, he's trying to shape a message is that's gonna bring people together. And there was a lot of factions, you know, there was a lot of tension um, and the book opens with even what he should say and a lot of disagreement about what he should say. So he's carrying all this in the head. Now he doesn't know that when he's going through this process, that the mall with a river of people, uh, 250,000 people are gathering. He doesn't know that at that point. He's in his, the Willard Hotel. So that's what I wanted to show, is that that's Martin and struggling with what the message is going to be. And then on the outside, that's sort of inside, outside. So inside is Martin, outside are all these folks coming to hear uh, the message of the messages of that day. Well, and it's a very powerful juxtapositions of images as well, because you have Dr. King yes. thinking. I mean, he's deep in, in thought. thought. And, you know, it reminds me, you know, of a sculpture that I love very much that I bet a, pro a, a lot of people in Philadelphia know, The Thinker. Does anybody know the sculpture of The Thinker on the parkway? Uh -huh. he's, he's kind of thinking like this. That's an iconic image because it's about this process of having something weighty mm -hmm. on your mind. And here you've taken that and brought it to life in the specific history of Dr. King. And you know, I, I see here, you know, there's a lot in this book, Jerry, about signs and yes. signage, signs that people have made. And on this side of the page, you have what's on Dr. King's mind, I think. And yes. you tell me if I'm wrong, but yes. here it's, you know, whites only, colors this direction, no dogs, no Negroes, no Mexicans. You know, that's, 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 what's, yeah. that's what he's carrying yeah, and that's carrying. what he wants to get over. And then on the next page is the, this river of people that mm -hmm. you described that are there in solidarity with him that he doesn't know yet, yeah. as you just said. Right. And then you have this other sign which is in the sky almost like a big sun or something. Mm -hmm. it, it's, like a, it's like a planet or a, <laughs> it, it, but it's, it's the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. It gives the date and there's a white hand and a black hand mm -hmm. shaking hands. And so what I find so powerful about this is the depth of it in human mm -hmm. terms of what you just described and that it's a before and after that the main character in your book doesn't know yet. Yes. And how amazing is that? To yeah. be able to imagine. Like, you had to think this up. I did. I, I, but it, it came out again, the text itself, but also the uh, research. Yeah. Um, and it and spent hours and hours and hours of time, um, not only not only because what I think is important about any research is it's those elements that you pull from outside that somewhat relate, um, uh, not always in, in a way that you think is usable at the time, but my work is all about energy. So I also listen to music from the, the 60s, the music of the marches. Um, yes, that's all part of it. Jerry? Um, I think it would be wrong if we didn't talk a little bit about the title of your book, A Place to Land. And 
I, I'd like to read the way the book begins because your book begins with a question. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe I'll read the question that the book begins with and ask you to talk about that and how the title comes together. Mm -hmm. So you read on the cover, A Place to Land Martin Luther, King, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Speech that Inspired a Nation. That's the title of the book. And you see the name Barry Wittenstein. That's the person, that's the author, the person who wrote the words. Jerry Pinckney, that's Jerry, who's sitting here, who's the person who made the images. <laughs> then, and, and it is a great privilege to be here together with Jerry. And then you open the book, and the first words that you read are, Martin Luther King Jr. was once asked if the hardest part of preaching was knowing where to begin. And then he answers, no, he said, the hardest part is knowing where to end. And I wonder, Jerry, if you could take that as a launching point. Well, I, I have to first, you know, say that, you know, I, I, in collaborating um, with an author, in this case, Barry Wittenstein, so you guys, first of all, do you know what collaborating is? You know what it means? Tell me. like kind of like working together. In this case, there's a writer, which often happens in, you know, in publishing, of course. There's the writer and then there's the artist. Now, so the title itself came from Barry or perhaps a meeting with the editors who Barry would work with. Then it's handed to me. But I will say something that, and I think you were alluding to, is that the fact that that opening spread and how you respond to that opening spread is probably close to the, how I, how I responded. Somehow or another, that just grabs you. Um, and it grabbed me. As a matter of fact, the interesting thing is the publisher and the editor said to me, he came to me and he, just, he didn't say, uh, we've got a project for, for you. He said, Jerry, can you tell me, um, do you, can you recommend an artist that does portraiture well to do this project? And I said, Neil, um, could I just take a look at it first? Now, I still don't know if he was baiting me to find out whether I was interested, and that was the way he was, he's very skillful, that was the way he, he went about it. But it was that opening spread that said, Oh, there's something that where Jerry Pinkney can contribute. And as I said before, I, I kind of sh shied away from the civil rights movement because it was so well documented. But something about those, that text, something about the opening, something about that um, Mahalia Jackson in the middle of his remarks shouting, tell him about the dream. Uh, I knew there was something there that I could contribute. And what it was, it was this fact that the photography couldn't show the interacting, that couldn't bring you to this point that these people were actually engaged with conversation with one another. And then Martin was engaged uh, with the crowd. And that Mahalia Jackson knew that it, something was missing and shouted out, tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream. And I said, that's it. I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but that's it. I know, and it, what it, the beauty of, of making any kind of, uh, of art, whether it's, is, uh, it's uh, once you arrive at something that's new to you, to me, the artist, I can use that. I can use that to create art that maybe, just maybe is new to you, that contributes to how you see this man and that moment, that historic and iconic moment in our country's history. It's so interesting, Jerry, because 
we probably all have an idea in our minds of what Martin Luther King yes. looks like. One of the things that I see in your book, and you tell me if I'm wrong about this, was you were not only interested in what he looks like, but you were interested in how he worked with his body and, yes. and specifically with his hands. hands. And I'm turning to the page here for everybody to see where Dr. King is actually giving the speech and he's surrounded by people. And here is Mahalia Jackson. And you can see that, Jerry, you did this in such a way where she stands out, he stands out, and the American flag stands out. You know, these are the bright colors on the page, yes. and then the softer colors are everything going on around these three people. But what I notice when I look at this picture is the hands involved mm -hmm. of the people. Not only Dr. King's hands, but Mahalia Jackson's hands. And I wonder if you can talk about how you got from this idea of what Martin Luther King looked like to his whole self. Yeah. Well, it's again, what the purpose I thought of what I could contribute was to show him as a breathing, active, searching, curious individual. And you just, this is a demonstration. You just saw me go. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I couldn't help. I couldn't help but bring hands into it. I use my hands all the time, and mm -hmm. and he he did as well. The, so I sort of, um, in order to make, you know, to give a sense of life, to give a sense of breath to the, to Dr. King and the people that surrounded him, the hands was a, a way of gesturing what was going on. So it was a visual kind of um, uh, tool that I use. And, and again, I talk with my hands, so that <laughs> it, it, uh, it sort of um, uh, follows suit. Now, the other piece I wanna talk about, and because this, this page is open, most of the images were somewhat borrowed from other photographs. I, I mean, I had to work from photographs. There are two where I, I held very closely to the photograph that was that we might find in, 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 in history books. This one here, where I had, you know, King is speaking and, and, and Mahalia Jackson is gesturing. So I, that I couldn't invent because they were real people at a real time, at a real place. So we actually got permission to use that photograph. However, what I did was, in order to bring some sense of life, what you don't see in that photograph, first of all, you don't see Mahalia Jackson gesturing. But if you look closely at the other people on that stage or podium uh, in the background, they're either looking at Martin, Dr. King, or they're looking at Mahalia Jackson, which is pure invention. Um, but it puts focus on that moment uh, and those two people. And, and I would say that where the absolute magic of your art resides, Jerry, is that you invented this interaction between the two figures. And you see Mahalia Jackson here, who's the figure wearing, she's wearing a hat and she's wearing a very decorative jacket. Um, she's holding up her hand, and you just yes. said you invented this yeah. hand, and she has her finger up like this, and there's her finger, and you, you make her finger stand out because it's against a dark color. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you see Dr. King's hands, and his hands are out like this, and there's almost like there's an electric current that runs between them across the page, and to me, that's, you know, that to me is real creativity, that you decided that you needed to tell this story somehow. And yes. you didn't set out to say, okay, I'm gonna connect their fingers. But you did say, I wanna show yeah. this, this energy, the this energy. sharing, this collaborating. And I bet everybody who's here has probably had a moment like that where you could talk with somebody else who is maybe a very close friend or maybe your parent or maybe a grandparent, or maybe 
you know, a babysitter or somebody else who's important to you, and you can understand what they're thinking and you mm -hmm. can communicate without using words, somehow or another, in this picture, you manage to convey that very human process, mm -hmm. but in a historic moment where it means so much because she's saying, talk about the dream, Martin, and he's meanwhile talking to 250,000 people, but he hears her, and it's an incredibly complicated yes. thing to have done, but you did it in a way that makes us, from our own human experiences, understand it. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is a great art. Well, thank you. I, and I, I want to say something. This is very, because you yeah. used the word art, and I, I kind of talked about it a little bit, but I want to go back and, and say that I never knew at this particular, in this particular project, whether it was working or not. Gloria can, again, attest to one year of committing myself, an investment in something I truly believed in, uh, a person, Dr. King, a time to march on Washington, the blossoming of the civil rights movement and all of its struggles and beauty at the same time. And I wanted to talk about that through pictures. And, um, and the only way I could think about talking to it about it in pictures was to invest what my thinking was and my feelings about that time. So the drawings are there to suggest not only to interpret Barry Wittenstein's text, but to also speak about what I thought about that time and how important Dr. King is in my life. Um, there is one other spread, and before we wrap up, but I think it's very important because the book, at some point, uh, originally what the book ended was in the Oval Office. And I think first of us, when we think about that time and we think about the hope that was in his remarks, we think about those high points. And yet at the same time, when I was working on this project, I realized they weren't all high points. And then not only that, but that those beautifully worded remarks and where he wanted to take us, we weren't there. We weren't there. And so I had to figure out how to do that. Um, and so could I just read the yeah. last oh, couple yeah. pages because Please. these were added to the original text. A lot of it had to do with being a person of color and realizing that his words were for me and his hopes is for me. So the White House and Kennedy, even though they played that role, they were also resistant to this whole thing. And then I asked myself, could those same remarks be given today? I came down on the side of yes. And that was very disturbing for me. And I had to work my way out of it. So let me just read a, a couple pages and, and we'll talk about them just a little bit. And remember, these were, these were ideas Discuss with Barry to turn into text. They all knew more battles lay ahead. Angry late night meetings in hotel lobbies, frantic phone calls, tears, and blood to be shed. Fighting every inch to cross a bridge to make Martin's dream come true. In that process of doing research, there was a photograph that I couldn't make sense of. And, I, and it was Martin Luther King with his fellow marchers. And they're wearing Hawaiian lays around their necks. This was after the march. And I took the photograph in my head, pushed it aside. It's got nothing to do with the march. It kept coming back. And so, I found that that 
wearing the lei, because I had to research it, and it, the Hawaiian lei is a symbol for love. Hmm. And so the power, then that, that lei became really power, it also became a power that I felt in here because, you know, he was about love. So we have this picture, one of the last pictures in here that has nothing to do with the march, but it does talk about the battles ahead because it was Bloody Sunday, then the successful uh, crossing of the uh, Pettus Bridge. And then I needed, and you'll notice in, the, in that you see me always looking for, uh, for hope. So you see the addition of the rainbow uh, that reflects all in, in different places. And then the last page. And those battles continue to be fought. But that night brought optimism and laughter. They all agreed Martin stepped up to the lectern and stepped down on the other side of history. And I said, history? I needed hope. We elected a black president. So the book ends with Martin, Shirley Chisholm, John Lewis, and the continuum President Barack Obama. And I said, no matter where we are right now, in this space, in this landscape, there's no stripping away. Not only that we elected our first black president, but what an elegant, moral human being. Now, we have some music coming up and other things that are going to happen, but I would love to give a chance for um, people to ask questions that might be on their mind. Is there anybody kind of close to us here who has a question? I'm going to start in close and we'll move out, but okay. any questions? Okay, I, 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 I see a hand right there. Oh, you did. <laughs> oh, I got, thought I saw got, somebody yeah. raising their hand. Okay, you it's have not, a you have a question. So you, you got from there's no room for you in this art world to there being room for you. Yes. Was there a moment or two that were key in that journey that you just tell us about? Oh, I, I think yeah, there there is one that Gloria often brings up the. And that was in high school. Um, and um, I really had my senior year a very fair uh, teacher. Um, but he was, he thought in, in many ways he was being helpful and his marking was great and even across the board, but there came a time when at that point Philadelphia had, the Board of Education gave out three scholarships to uh, art students, art schools of their choice. And um, he came, he had applications for um, these scholarships. Um, he gave them to all the white students. And none to the black students. I didn't get what he was trying to say. So I went down to the counselor's office and I got um, forms. And I gave them out to the black students. That year, three, <laughs> as I said, there were three scholarships given out. And there, by the way, I went to a vocational school, but all the schools had incredible art departments. It was a very competitive. Dobbins, we got two scholarships. One to my friend Warren Neal, who was African American, and one to myself. So I think that is showed that what I had believed in, um, there were two sides to it, and, and I had to fight for that right side. 
Um, so that's perhaps um, uh, as close as I can get to that moment when I realized um, how important it was to stay into the fight. Thank you. Another question? Yeah. Yes. 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 Right. Yeah, I mean, that's beautiful. I mean, and, and in a sense, when you think about it, this came up yesterday about, in a sense, it could be a sort of a call and response. Um, you know what I mean? Is that all those in your right, the, 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 the weight of the, and the value of, of music as the uplifting force at a time when we, you know, I mean, it was the, it was that thing that gave us hope. Yeah, and not only, it was unifying. Yeah. Well, and I would point out, that's such a, a great observation because, and I think people who are close by here can see that throughout the book, we talked about collage. Part of the collage in the book is musical notations. So here's the scale and here are notes. And so it's like the music is part of the story, like you said. And then I would also say, everybody should get ready because just before yeah. this conversation, Jerry and I and some other people who work here at the museum were talking about an exhibition of Jerry's work that relates to music. And imagine how exciting that would be. So it's all about music. Yeah. I think that in order to make some time for music, yay, <laughs> to make some time for music, we should have a big round of applause for Jerry Pinckney. Mm.